We stand for His glory. We stand for His kingdom. In His name we pray, amen. Please have a seat if you would. Looks like the smoke machine fired up there at the end. I see some of you out there. I would like you to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. And as we uh, get into the scripture, uh, there's a question I'm going to ask you as we go uh, through our little talk today. And that, that question is this. Who do you need to forgive? Who has hurt you? Who's abused you or betrayed you? Attacked you? Who's been cruel to you or harsh to you? Who has abandoned you or forsaken you? Who's lied about you? Who's made decisions that have been good for them but bad for you? Who do you need to forgive today? Matthew chapter 18 Beginning of verse 21, it says, Then Peter came to him, Jesus, and said, Lord, how often shall I forgive? Uh, shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Now, for Peter, that was kind of radical. Seven times. The rabbis taught you only had to forgive three times. After you've sinned against me three times, then I don't have to forgive you for that anymore. So Peter's like, he's being super spiritual, and he goes, Well, how many times should I forgive? Seven times? Huh? Seven? And then verse 22, Jesus said, I uh, do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Bam. It kind of blew him away. 70 times seven. And then Jesus, uh, being a great teacher, used the moment to tell a story that would teach a great lesson. And he says in verse 23, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, we don't use talents as a, a currency now, but in, in our way of thinking, 10,000, by the way, in the original language here, was the biggest number they had available. So it's like saying millions and billions, an unpayable amount. So this guy had essentially embezzled millions and millions of dollars from his boss. Verse 25, but as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. So um, not a good thing. Verse 26, the servant fell before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. Now, I know there's a little more to this story, and we're going to get to it in a minute, but I just want to ask you that question again. Who has hurt you? Who has abused you or attacked you or abandoned you? Who has belittled you or betrayed you? Who's been cruel to you in your life? Who's been harsh to you? Who has set you up to fail? Who has stolen from you or lied to you? Who do you need to forgive today? That's the question. That's the issue. Now, a guy named Lewis Smedes wrote a book that I recommend to you. It's called Forgive and Forget. I'm just going to read you. Uh, a paragraph out of the beginning of that book. Listen, he said, someone hurt you, maybe yesterday, maybe a lifetime ago, but you can't forget it. You didn't deserve the hurt. Maybe you still can't even understand it. It went deep, deep enough to lodge itself, not only in your memory, but in your heart. And it keeps on haunting you and keeps on hurting you even now. And then he says, you're not alone. We all muddle through a world where well-meaning people hurt each other. Now, several years ago, uh, Kathy and I went through a situation, and we were really, really, really hurt by some people we had trusted. And I was studying this subject and thinking about forgiveness, and I wrote these words. 
Deep hurts from past relationships can poison and pollute our present relationships. These unhealed wounds fester and spread until they steal our joy, pilfer our peace, rob our intimacy with God, and shortchange our possibilities of other close relationships. Each old hurt becomes like a bar locking our souls into a prison of bitterness. They become shackles holding us back and dragging us down. But it doesn't have to be that way. Jesus provided a new means of dealing with old hurts. Forgiveness. I wonder who do you need to forgive today? Who is it that when I've mentioned this a couple times, a face has come into your mind. Somebody's come to your attention. Who do you need to forgive today? Well, let's go back and, and uh, take this passage apart a little bit. Then Peter came to him in verse 21 and said, Lord, how often shall I forgive? Up to seven times. Now, Jesus in verse 22 says, no, you got to forgive him up to 70 times seven. What is Jesus doing here? Jesus is showing that it's not about, you know, when I was younger, I, my older brother was a pain. I mean, anybody ever have an older brother or sister that's a pain? Maybe they're sitting right in this room, but they, they're, they, they're just evil. They're mean to you. And I remember hearing, you know, Sunday school, they talked about this. And I remember he did something to me, and I'm like, okay, that's 73 times. I only got to forgive you four more times. But that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus isn't saying you count, and then 78, you let him have it. He's saying forgiveness should be a lifestyle for you. It should be an unconditional thing in your life. Now, what he's also doing is he's talking to Jewish people. So they knew the Torah. They knew the book of Genesis. They knew Genesis 4 where it talks about the law of Lamech, which is the law of revenge. Lamech was Adam and Eve had a son, Cain and Abel. Cain had a son named Lamech, and somebody treated him wrong. And so he said, I'm going to get vengeance up to 70 times 7. So Jesus is saying, you know what? That law of vengeance is now replaced with the law of grace and forgiveness. And so he turns everything around like he always did and took away the power of bitterness and revenge and replaced it with the power of forgiveness. So Jesus tells a story about the guy he... Uh, as I just read, the guy who works for a king, really rich guy, that's the, uh, if you were really rich, you could have your own little kingdoms in the, in the world back then. This king wanted to settle accounts, found out the guy owed him millions and millions of bucks, said, bring him in. The guy what, didn't have any way to pay it back. He'd already spent all the money. And so he sold him into slavery. Now, what they did back then is you couldn't file for bankruptcy. You went to debtor's prison. And so this guy went to debtor's prison. But because he owed so much money, his family had to go too. They had to go work to try to pay off this debt. In fact, this guy owed so much money, it would have been the deal where his, his, not only his kids, but his grandkids would have to go work when they were able. Terrible thing. Well, the guy does what, what uh, the only thing he had an option to do. It says, the servant, verse 26, fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me, have mercy on me, I will pay you all. Now, the guy is never going to be able to pay him back. But the master, the king, the master of that servant, verse 27, was moved with compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. Say, wow. Say it backwards. Say it with a little enthusiasm. Wow. Think about it. This guy owes millions of bucks, and the king says, you know what, I'll just, I'll pay it. 
I'll cover you. You're forgiven, forgotten, you're good. That's amazing. Now, especially in that culture, that no one ever did that. No one had ever done that. That was just radical. That was just totally unbelievable. And then Jesus said a very uh, interesting thing. He continues this story in verse 28, Matthew 8, 28. The story of forgiveness denied. So you have the story of forgiveness extended. That was the first one. And the second part of the story is the story of forgiveness denied. Denied. Verse 28. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Now, a hundred denarii would be essentially less than a hundred bucks. So the guy who's just been forgiven millions and millions and millions of dollars he can never repay has a dude that owes him a hundred bucks and he gets him and says, get in here. He laid his hands on him, took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe me. So his fellow servant did exactly what he had just done with the king and it says he fell down at his feet and begged him saying, have patience with me, have mercy on me, I will pay you all. And the guy should have said, okay, I'll forgive you. I just got forgiven millions and millions of bucks. I can forgive you a hundred bucks. I got forgiven an unpayable, incredible, massive amount. I can forgive you this little thing that, that is between you and me. Right? That's what you would expect. But verse 28 doesn't say that. Uh, 30 doesn't say that. It says, and he would not, but went out and threw him into prison till he would repay. Now you read that, you're like, well, what a jerk. Who would do that? You get forgiven this massive, huge amount of millions and millions of bucks you can never repay. And somebody owes you less than 100 bucks. And you won't forgive them. Jerk, jerk, jerk. Then Jesus, verse 31 so when the fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. So his master, the master of the guy who had been forgiven but was not forgiving, came and told, uh, then their master, after he called them, verse 32, said, you wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had compassion and pity on you? The answer would be yes. 34. And his master was angry, I guess, and delivered him to the torturers till he should pay all that was due him. He said, you're not only going to debtor's prison, dude, you're going to the dungeon and they're going to torture you because you are such a big jerk. Then verse 35, Jesus does that thing. He says, verse 35, so my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from your heart doesn't forgive his brother his trespasses. Now, that's not everybody's favorite verse. I've never seen that on a plaque in anybody's house, or uh, they don't sell those at the Christian bookstore. I've never seen that on a T-shirt, but that is a Bible verse and the words of Jesus. Now, there's a tad of her hyperbole there, but the point he's making is this. Okay, think about it. If, I mean, who, who are we in this story? We're that guy who owes an unpayable debt. Because every one of us in this room, God, if he kept score on us all the time with no mercy and no grace, we'd be racking up massive debt day after day after day with our, our ignorance, our disobedience, our selfishness, our rebellion, our, our, our just unwillingness to trust him our unwillingness to love like he loves, our unwillingness to love people like he loves people, we would just be racking up, and we are racking up this massive, incredible, unpayable debt, and yet because of Jesus Christ dying for us on the cross, the Father says, you know what? I will forgive you all of it, 
and not make you a slave. In fact, I'll make you a son or a daughter. We've been for, we're the guy that's been forgiven an incredible amount, so it only makes sense that we would forgive one another these debts that we have against each other. And this is a Baptist church, so that's where you should say amen. Amen. Very good job. <laughs> couple uh, thoughts there. God grant, grants us forgiveness at a great cost to himself. Do you realize that the cost that uh, allows us to experience forgiveness is the one that uh, Jesus paid for us. One man said, forgiveness is costly, but there's only thing which is more costly than forgiving someone, not forgiving them. God grants us forgiveness at great cost to himself. Jesus is the one who took all our pain, all our punishment. He, went, he was tortured for us. He went through all of it so that we could be forgiven. God grants us forgiveness at great cost to himself. Such uh, forgiveness should prompt us naturally to forgive other people. Such forgiveness should prompt us to forgive other people. See on your outline, failing to forgive will ultimately hurt us more than the other person. Failing to forgive is ultimately going to hurt us more than the other person. This guy who refused to forgive ended up being put with the torturers. Uh, I wrote these words a while back. Although this prison doesn't have visible bars, chains, and torture chambers, they're every bit as real. When we harbor bitterness in our hearts toward another, we unwillingly become a prisoner to them. Just the mention of their name can flood our minds with powerful and ugly thoughts. Seeing them elevates our heart rate and blood pressure, hearing their voice can make us wince and cringe. Even when they're not even thinking about us, we cannot stop thinking about them. That we become their prisoner and our bitterness toward them tortures us. Have you ever noticed that if you're bitter towards somebody, you're holding a grudge towards somebody, you have unforgiveness towards somebody, you have resentment towards somebody, they can be in a different room, not thinking about you, but you're thinking about, they can be in a different town, they can be in a different state, they can be in a different country, they might not even be alive anymore, yet they are controlling your thoughts because you have created that power through bitterness, resentment, holding a grudge, unforgiveness. That's dumb. Just a thought there. D, there's only one way out of the prison, uh, prison of harbored hurts, and that is forgiveness. There's only one way out. There's only one way out, and that is choosing Choosing to forgive. Uh, number seven. Uh, number, uh, sorry. Failing to forgive is costly. Failing to forgive it will cost you. Forgiveness is costly, but there's only one thing that costs more than forgiving someone, and that is not forgiving someone. Say, so it's going to cost me a hundred bucks to forgive this guy. Yeah, but it costs you a lot more not to forgive that guy. Second, it is costly to those hoping to have a relationship with God. This one got me. Okay, I used to pray through the Lord's Prayer. I go through seasons when I, I pray different prayers uh, as part of my prayer time. And I was praying through the Lord's Prayer, you know, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you pray through that like an outline. And I came to this part. Forgive us our debts, you know the rest of it, as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Now, I would be rolling down through that prayer and doing pretty good and asking God to forgive whatever I could think of that I needed forgiving, and then I would get to the part, and it's like, okay, who do I need to forgive? And the same uh, faces kept coming to my mind. 
And I'm like, God, I'll forgive anybody, anything, but I really don't want to forgive those people, that thing. You know what I'm talking about? I trusted, I believed, and I'm still paying the price. The third aspect of forgiveness being costly is it costs you your well-being. I mean, from purely a non-spiritual approach, it's not smart to be bitter. A guy, a PhD, Fred Luskin, University of Stanford, did a research called the Forgiveness Project. This is what he said. Carrying around a load of bitterness and rage at how unfairly you were treated is very toxic. He said, letting go of a grudge can slash one's stress level up to 50%. Volunteers in our study showed improvements in energy, mood, sleep quality, and overall physical vitality. Another study uh, showed that giving up a grudge can reduce chronic back pain, and um, practicing forgiveness limits relapse of uh, addicts of those uh, battling substance abuse. Bruce McElwain, a PhD at Rockefeller University in New York City, said that when you have bitterness and resentment in your heart, you release a steady stream of stress hormones that become toxins. They will ultimately break down your brain, hurt your memory, decline your cells, raise your blood sugar, harden your arteries, and lead to heart disease. I got a question for you. Who do you need to forgive today? Who's, a, who's abused you? Who's hurt you? Who's lied about you? Who's been unfair to you? Who's mistreated you? You need to choose to forgive them. For the glory of God. Because God has forgiven you so much and just for common sense. All right, I'm going to make it really practical because I think sometimes we don't understand exactly what this means. So I'm going to go quickly. I'm going to tell you what forgiveness is not, then I'm going to tell you what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is not the same thing as excusing. It is not the same thing as excusing. Look, if it's a little thing and you can, you can just uh, let love cover a multitude of sins, then just let it go. We're talking about choosing to forgive something hard. Number two, choosing is also not tolerating sin. It's not being a doormat. It's not letting somebody walk all over you. When we forgive somebody who do wrongs us, that does not mean that we tolerate or accept their wrong behavior. Third thing, forgiveness is not forgetting. You don't magically, although sometimes, but you don't necessarily magically forget what happened to you. When it says God forgets our sins, the word used there talks about the fact that he doesn't allow our... God, God is, is, knows every single fact about every single thing in the universe. What it means is God does not functionally allow our sins to come between us and him. He doesn't allow it to mar the relationship. Number four, forgiveness is not foolishness. If somebody cheated you in a business deal, don't make, you don't have to make another business deal with them. If you're getting beat up at home, don't go back home. You can forgive the person that, uh, that beat you, uh, that abused you, but you don't go back into that situation. It's not uh, foolishness. Number five, forgiveness is not waiting until they say they are sorry. Because they might not ever say they're sorry. You're not waiting until they tell you that they're sorry. You're choosing to forgive them so that you and God are good and your heart is good and your mind is good regardless of what's going on with them. Now let's talk about what forgiveness is. Number one, it's choosing to cancel a debt. It's canceling a debt. That's why Jesus used this story, great story. Because in our minds, we, we got like, okay, you owe me for that. You owe me for that. You owe me for that. And we keep this little record, and forgiveness is, is uh, wiping it clean. Number two, forgiveness is setting yourself free. You see, when I choose to forgive you and not send you to debtor's prison, 
I'm setting me free. Smead said, the first person who gets the benefit of forgiving is always the person who does the forgiving. When you forgive a person who's wronged you, you set a prisoner free, and you discover that the prisoner you set free is you. Number three, forgiveness is, is giving up the right to get even. Now, that's really hard for me. I love getting even. I love making people pay. I like the Avengers. <laughs> Number four, forgiveness is looking past the hurt to the person. You see, this is what God does for us. We gotta, we, think about how many times we've hurt him, dissed him, ignored him, mocked him, denied him, mistrusted him, misunderstood him, mis misjudged his motives, but yet God looks past that to see our pain. You realize it's hurting people are the ones that hurt people. Paul said this way, said it this way. He says, forgive one another, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, and every form of malice. How? Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Number five, forgiveness is making four promises. So when I choose to forgive you, I am making in my mind, my heart, four promises. Number one, I'm not going to dwell on this incident. I'm not going to keep thinking about it. I'm not going to keep mulling it over in my mind. I'm not going to keep replaying the, the video. I'm not going to dwell on it. Number two, I will not bring this incident up again and use it against you. You heard about the guy that went to his pastor and he said, I, I, you know, I need help with my wife. And he's like, what's the problem? And the guy said, my wife is uh, historical. And the pastor said, do you mean hysterical? And the, pastor, and the guy said, no, historical. She keeps a memory list of everything I've ever done wrong. Look, when you forgive it, you don't throw it back in their face again. Number three, when I choose to forgive you, I am t I'm choosing not to talk to others about this incident. You know, Christians are good at this. We're like, you know, um, Cody, would you pray with me? Because Nick really hurt me, and I'm just having a hard time with Nick because he's such a jerk, and he did. You know, we're, we're, that, that, it's not forgiving. That's gossip, actually. Now you're just compounding your sin. Nick actually didn't do anything wrong to me, and it is his birthday, so we need to, you know. Yesterday. yesterday is his birthday, so. Zach's birthday today. Bethany's tomorrow. <laughs> Happy birthday to all. <laughs> Number six. No, no, no. Uh, the fourth promise I'm making. I will not let this incident stand between us or hinder our relationship. I'm not, when I deal with you, this is not going to be a rock between us for the rest of our lives. Number six, forgiveness is ultimately wishing the other person well. It's like, really? But Paul said, hey, get rid of all your bitterness. Be kind to one another, compassionate to one another. Forgiving as you have been, forgive them as you have been forgiven. Number seven, forgiveness is something that usually takes time. Look, if this is a deep hurt, you, sh you, you choose to forgive, but it, it's not going to, it's, it's got deep roots. It takes a while to pull that out. Look at me for a second. When we were in Vegas, especially, dealing with a lot of people with awful lives, awful addictions, incredible levels of abuse. When you're asking somebody to forgive a, a, a father who sexually abused them over and over and over again, or a mother who abandoned them when they were a baby. Or parents who are addicts and steal all their kids' money. When you're asking someone to forgive these horrific life pain things, you got to understand, it's not like you come to the altar and say, Jesus, I choose to forgive them, and you're up and you're like, woo! It doesn't always happen that way. It takes a while. 
With these people, I'm telling you about that, that I would pray the Lord's Prayer and they would keep coming to mind. First day, I'm like, okay, God, I choose to forgive them. The next day, I'm praying, you know, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have sinned against us, who, who are debtors. And I'm like, God, is there anybody I need to forgive? Boom, there they are. I'm like, really? And it was three, four weeks until they kind of would get, the faces coming up in my mind would get murkier and murkier and murkier until gone. And by the grace of God, I can tell you, I saw those uh, people about a year later, and by the grace of God, I was able to go up and look each one in the eye and say, hey, love you. Give them a hug. Watch them squirm a little bit. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and I had nothing in my heart. Uh, it was interesting. I was working on this sermon two weeks ago, and on Tuesday I get a phone call from a guy. About eight or nine years ago, Kathy and I were supposed to take over a ministry at a university in um, Virginia, this great church there. And the founder of that ministry got really scared when, like, right, we were, we were about a week away from buying the condo. He got really scared that I was just going to go in and, and change it and ruin it. And so he squelched it. Call me, at, phone rings, and it's him. He's like, Dave, you know, I've, I've had this on my heart. I know I did the wrong thing. I just... I know that I, you got treated wrong in this whole deal, and I just want to ask you to forgive me. And this is, the, this is the truth. This is the grace of God. I'm like, okay, but I've already forgiven you. I can tell you, I, I hadn't thought about that. I had not given it one thought in years. God can give you the grace To pull out the roots of bitterness, set you free. We sang earlier, you know, we're, we're, shackles are gone, glory, glory, hallelujah. It'd be dumb for you to walk out today in bondage when you don't have to. I... Uh, Number eight, forgiveness is walking in step with God. Colossians 3.13 says, we're supposed to forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. You say, how on earth can I forgive this person for this thing? Well, this is how it starts. You take all the forgiveness you have been given and you take that stuff and give it to them. I can't necessarily give you my forgiveness because I don't, what I got, I don't, not much. But I can take the, all the forgiveness God has given me and I can start giving that to you. Forgive as you have been forgiven. If I think, remember that God sent his son Jesus to die to pay for all my massive amount of debt that I owe God, then it's not that hard for me to give, forgive you that $100 debt that you owe me. Forgiveness is impossible without faith. For, number nine, forgiveness is impossible without faith. I love this. Jesus goes through all this, and then the disciples go, okay. Uh, it says, even if they sin against you seven times in a day, and seven times come back to you, he said, I, you, and say, repent, you must forgive him. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. What they're saying is, I can't do this. I can't do this. God, I need your grace. There was a guy, um, I read his story in a, a book a couple years ago. And he said, I got saved. But he said, I hated this about church. Everybody would talk about feeling the presence of God. And he said, I never quite felt it. And I would go in and I would really want to feel God. And he, he, and he said, I just couldn't feel God. And, and then they had some teaching about forgiveness. And he said, my mom had abandoned me when I was four years old. And I've been bitter towards her for 39 years, he wrote. And I realized I needed to forgive my mom. 
He said, with a trembling hand, I dialed the number. He said, I hadn't spoke to her in 39 years, and she answered the, the phone with the number they gave me. And I said, Mom, this is your son. I've hated you for 39 years for abandoning me. But today, I choose to forgive. She began to cry and she said, Son, I've hated myself for 39 years for abandoning you. She said, Do you think God can forgive me? The guy said, The next time I went in church, I felt God. He said, I started to cry like a baby. He said, I was embarrassed. I was crying so much. He said, but for the first time, I felt, I felt free. I don't know what you've experienced. I don't know who has hurt you. I don't know how they've hurt you. I don't know if they've abused you or abandoned you or lied about you. I don't know if they betrayed you. I don't know if they've been cruel to you. I don't know if they've hit you or, or molested you. I don't know if, if, if they've forgotten you or forsaken you or given you up. But I know this. God does love you. And God has immeasurable forgiveness for you. And I know this. By His grace, you can start today choosing to forgive that person. And you'll hear the, the door of the prison cell open. And you can start walking out into freedom. Would you bow your heads? You know, there's no use leaving here with any, anything in your heart that doesn't need to be there. Today, why don't you just make that choice? In fact, I'm going to ask you, your heads are bowed. I'm the guy looking around. God's looking around, obviously. Well, there's somebody you need to forgive and God has spoken to you and you're saying, by the grace of God, I'm choosing to forgive today. Would you just look up at me and just kind of nod when my eyes see your eyes? You say, there's somebody I need to forgive today. Somebody I need to forgive. I need to let go of this. God bless all of you. There's somebody I need to forgive and God's been speaking to me today. Yes, and I choose to forgive. I choose to forgive. God bless each of you. God bless you. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus, you just pour out right now, Holy Spirit. Pour out grace. Pour out forgiveness. Pour out blessing. Pour out mercy. Pour out your presence. Holy Spirit.